All right. As I sort of impatiently wait for the time to go. So I know we only have 30 minutes. Um, so I do want to get us started here. So I just want to say uh, a big thank you and a welcome um, and to, uh, greetings to everyone and, and welcome to this session of the Generative AI Teaching Conversation webinar series. My name is Sean Leahy. I'm the Director of Creative and Emerging Technologies for Enterprise Technology here at ASU, and I'll be your host today. Um, and I'd like to extend a special thank you to the Provost Office for hosting this 30-minute engaging conversation with our expert panels panelists from ASU here to provide an opportunity for faculty, staff, and students to engage in contemporary and emergent discussions around the use of generative AI in higher education. And for today's topic, we'll be exploring how can ASU foster a positive culture around using generative AI. Um, and to do that, I'm joined by three amazing panelists here. Um, so I'll quickly go around and introduce um, each of them in turn. Um, first, starting with, with Punya Mishra. Punya is Associate Dean of Scholarship and Innovation at the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College here at ASU, um, where he leads multiple initiatives providing a future-forward, equity-driven, collaborative approach to educational research. He is internationally recognized for his work in educational technology, creativity, and the application of design to educational innovation. Welcome, Punya. Thanks, Sean. You could have kept the bar a little lower, but that's okay. Thank you for that intro. <laughs> I was tempted to go with your really, your, your micro. Uh, bio. You should have gone with the chat GPT version of it, which is actually <laughs> quite funny. Uh, excellent. And we are also joined again um, by Katina Michael. Katina is a professor in the School for Future of Innovation and Society and School of Computing and Augmented Intelligence at ASU. She's a global, senior global futures scientist, director of the Society Policy Engineering Collective, and founding chair of the Masters of Public Interest Technology. She is also the founding editor-in-chief of the IEEE Sanctions on Technology and Society and senior IEEE member in the Society for the Social Implications of Technology. Welcome, Katina. Thank you, Sean. And then, of course, we have, last but not least, Ted Pavlik. Ted is the Associate Professor of the School of Computing and Augmented Intelligence and the School of Life Sciences and was the founding Associate Director of Research for the Biomimicry Center at ASU and continues to be closely associated with the center. His research focuses on understanding adaptive decision-making strategies in autonomous systems. To this end, his laboratory does empirical work with natural systems, such as social insect colonies, and does engineering work building decision-making algorithms for artificial systems, such as decentralized energy management systems for the built environment. Welcome, Ted. Thanks. All right. So um, again, what an amazing panel of experts uh, collected here today. So um, we're all deeply excited, I think, to hear um, your input and your take on a lot of these issues surrounding uh, generative artificial intelligence. Um, I think it's you know pretty well known now that the discussion around generative AI, especially in higher education, has been a highly active conversation since last fall, especially with the release of things like OpenAI's ChatGPT. Um, and doing so, looking at all aspects of this newly accessible technology and tool set, it has reached a lot of conversations uh, around the globe. Um, last week, for example, this webinar series, we started off taking a closer look at understanding some of the basic or at least some of the more fundamental operational layers of what generative AI tools are um, and what kinds of tools are available and how they might be being used in higher ed and at ASU. And throughout this time, we've seen, of course, also in the popular press and news outlets, a full spectrum of responses to these tools. We've seen institutions and organizations embrace the potential to create new, authentic, and deeper learning experiences by leveraging generative AI tools in the education system. And we've also seen groups and individuals banning tools, calling for halts in developments. And of course, anytime we've been talking about artificial intelligence, there seems to be this ever-present existential conversation that looms um, near it. Um, uh, but so given that as a collective global society, though, these tools are out there, these are available. Um, we can't put this innovation back in a bottle, so to speak. So really what I'd like to do then is sort of kick off this question. And Katina, I'd like to maybe direct this first question over to you to get this panel started, is just thinking about how at ASU, for example, can we foster this a, a positive culture around incorporating these generative AI tools into all of the aspects of the things that we do here, teaching, learning, research, and even creative activity? Well, the one word that comes to mind, Sean, is immersion. 
uh, there's nothing like using an emerging technology, even if it's in, in its nascent stages and seeing what it can do. Take it for a test drive. You know, no one buys a car without getting in it and seeing what it can do, you know. And so what are the ethical, legal, social implications? How does our imagination embrace such futures? What are the limits of the technology? Where can we see it being applied? And if you're not using, then you're not really understanding. And I think looking at it from a techno social critical perspective is a, is a great way. What are the techno futures here? Uh, and what are we doing with it today? And I think that's a one way to look at it from all the aspects that you described in the teaching, in the classroom, um, to come out with, with okay, this looks like a, a good tool to use at the exploratory stage, but beyond that, you know, it sort of loses its grandeur at the moment, given where it's at, but we are seeing developments, for example, of chat GPTs, uh, and we are looking at how we can use generative AI for imagery and the creative realm, but also for film and video, you know, these FRAN networks that look at how you can create actors and uh, do things like de-age and re-age. So immersion, understanding the limits of the technology, understanding the potential and the possibilities, and understanding better those exploratory fundamental questions like the ethics, the law, the social implications to come. Yeah, that's interesting. Punya or, or Ted, did, what are your thoughts about this This kind of broad, I mean, it's a very broad question, right? Um, but thinking about like, you know, what are this, how do we, you know, Katina mentioned immersion. What are some of the other thoughts that you have about ways that we can foster this this positive culture around the, about incorporating these tools? Well, I guess one thing, um, you know, when we talk about culture and life sciences, we often talk about, you know, inoculating a culture plate and letting something grow. And one of the things that, um, when we talk about ethics, um, I think it is important to think about ethics and, and the use of technology in general, whether it be chat, be GPT or an elevator. But um, the, the, I guess the question I would have is, is, is you know, can we get you know, useful examples of unethical use? And so right now, I think we need to kind of loosen our constraints a bit. Right now, it sounds like you know, for a lot of people, if you use text generated by chat GPT, then they say that's that's tantamount to plagiarism or something like that. And I guess that's one place we could start, but it, it does seem like there's a, a little bit of a category error there because um, it, it it isn't exactly the same, you know? I mean, uh, it, ChatGPT is sort of, um, it comes out of this idea of, of text completion effectively, you know, the same sort of things that in the end people had no problem with going to Google and type in three words and see how it completes the next three words. And people would play these games and things. And that was sort of a fun activity to sort of, you know, and to think about, wow, that's weird that these strings of words came up. And we need that type of, of culture around the sort of chat GPT too. Um, in order for us to then start really asking the questions of, all right, well, then what is really the unethical, maybe an unethical use is to use ChatGPT GPT without any editing to submit um, a letter to an insurance company justifying why a doctor prescribed a particular medication. Well, that goes beyond just simply using the text of chat GPT. You know, I mean, there was a joke earlier Punya made about, you know, shortening his bio with the chat GPT version. And I don't think any of us would say that would be an unethical version, uh, you know, an unethical way to use chat GPT. So I think just, you know, we we need to sort of start embracing just use and, um, and, and loosening our definitions of what it means to be unethical when you're using these tools. So if I can just jump on that, I mean, firstly, I, if you haven't seen the bio, I asked Bing Chat or whatever to create a humorous self-deprecating bio of me, and it is hilarious. I mean, some of the comments it made were like actually cut to the bone about how close they were to, you know, pain points. Um, but I think the, the points that have been raised around immersion, around playing with it, around imagination, and thinking of creative use cases, I think is sort of critical at this juncture uh, of time, right? Um, so I'm just thinking of, um, I recently um, heard from one of my colleagues that his son prepared for a chemistry exam using chat GPT by entering in the content that the teacher said was going to be in the exam and asked chat GPT to ask him questions. Mm. Now that's such a beautiful example of how this technology can be used. So that is completely ethical as far as I can see, but takes advantage of the generative capability of that tool in a really powerful way. And I think the same goes for in the area of media and the arts, um, where we can see the flowering of new genres of experimentation and play. I mean, you know, cinema, you know, 
television and you know now what kind of new media will emerge from this so there is a strong positive sort of an aspect to it i think at this point in time we are sort of just at the beginning of what this could be so there is a a positive piece on that and there are other aspects too which i think we will get to uh, when we look at some of the other you know concerns that we can have with these tools as well yeah i do i do often wonder too right with um also just sort of the while people who have been working with these tools for quite some time have had time to really push on the boundaries of what is possible, like what can it do? What can it not do? Um, and then, but all of a sudden we have this explosion of, you know, it's in the hands of everybody, so to speak, who wants to get it. Um, and then there's a lot of speculation around it. What, like Ted, I think you had mentioned, right? There's like, you know, that you're just kind of putting a label that if it's used, therefore it is in some category. Um, and so also trying to understand, right, as we build this sort of culture around using it and immerse, immersive experiences of having opportunities to play and push and find those, what are what are the affordances and constraints of these things? Um, I, I do want to kind of move on to a question um, that was, you know, it's a question that we have here, but it was also already briefly sort of sort of touched on it. And that's kind of the, the idea around some of the ethical considerations of using these. So addressing some of those sort of major concerns and challenges. Um, so keeping up with this this um, culture, this positive culture around incorporating it, will take an ongoing commitment. As we know, these tools are rapidly evolving. Um, there's new ones all the time coming out. And really thinking about, you know, it'll take this this sort of consistency of us playing and learning and, and, and exploring with them. Um, but so Punya, maybe if I could have you start us off with this question, thinking about knowing that it is a fast moving um, technology and development, how do we approach this technology and maybe others, right? Um, with an open mind and this commitment to ethical use, knowing that a lot of times, and I think we talked about this maybe last week as well, that the technological developments usually far outpace regulatory frameworks and things like that. Um, so how do we do that? Or how do we approach this with an ethical lens of, you know, experimentation, but also keeping that those those sort of ethical concerns of those usages, um, you know, at top of mind as well. Sure. So I think, you know, because we are ASU and everything has the label of innovation associated with it. I think the themes that emerge from what Katina and, and Ted and I sort of spoke about for the first response speak to that piece. But I think I want to address, you know, a, a new sort of aspect that we have brought into our design aspirations just a few months ago, that of principal innovation. And I think, and to me, that's a really powerful sort of an idea because it says just because we can do something, should we, are we thinking of the ethical implications, the implications of on of these technologies? And, you know, um, like, I, mean, I love that example that you gave of an elevator. Because if you think about it, a staircase is a technology, but the moment you build a staircase, there's a power you can build up. However, the moment you do that, you have now relegated a certain group of people to being disabled because they cannot climb the stairs, right? And so then you have to create. So that's always been the story of technology. It has always given to some while taken away from others. And we often don't think about who it has taken away from. We often don't think about who are the people who this technology is marginalizing, whose voices are not being heard. And typically, and you can see that happen during the COVID-19 pandemic, that the, the effect of the pandemic were felt very differently on different groups of people, depending on prior and existing inequities that were in our society. And so the question for me then becomes, which is why this sort of idea of principle innovation, which at its heart is a sort of a humanistic perspective that brings multiple voices in, is always asking ourselves, what, do, what are the implications of this, not just for me, but for society at large, I think are really, really important. It's an important framework for me that, that ASU has taken on this design aspiration, because I think it speaks to our commitment to the ethical use of these tools and technologies, even while experimenting with them and playing with them. You know, one of the things I was thinking of, and I think I mentioned this before, that, you know, if I have to do a study with one person that I have to interview them for, you know, a paper that I want to write, I have to get IRB approval. What OpenAI did was a global experiment with no guardrails, right? I mean, would a principal innovation framework have possibly said, let's go a little slower on this and, 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 and think about 
testing it out before? I mean, these are the kinds of questions where I think ASU is particularly well positioned to ask because A, we have credibility in the innovation space, but we also bring a core sort of set of values to the work that we do. And I think that's a very important piece of that conversation that we, I think we lead and we should continue to lead in that. Oh, one final I thing. A shout out to the teachers college because the, the the PI work emerged from over six years of work here. So I want to take a little bit of a credit for the College of Ed. Well, that college is awesome, Punya. Absolutely awesome. And uh, the amazing work that's coming out of that with respect to futures and learning is, is spectacular. Um, dovetailing on that, I totally agree. I mean, emerging technologies are coming out all the time. They're pushing the boundaries. We have implantable solutions today. Who, who knows what we'll have tomorrow? The question is, can you prejudge ethics? Coming back to your main statement there, Sean, that provocative statement, what do we do about ethics? And there are two schools of thought. One is, you know, you can only understand ethics once you start to use something. You can point your finger at it and say, you know, oh, that's bad or that's good, but that's too simplistic for these new complex emerging technologies. And what we're saying now, uh, singing the songs of uh, Punya's and Punya's team is, how do you embed ethics in the design process? We talk about responsible innovation in our School for the Future of Innovation in Society. We talk about ELSI, the ethical, legal, social implications. You talk about ethical alignment by design, value sensitive design, value based design. All of these design processes now are embedding ethics at the heart of the innovation process. You know, what are the risks? Can we treat those risks? If we can't, then that particular feature set you know, stays on a dormant list of potential features. But this is highly embedded in the design process. And um, those of us who are in the innovation space now want to use hum human-centered design processes. I mean, that's the big talk in the AI industry at the moment. Is this a human-centered design process? Are we looking at the social and technical and the environment uh, ecosystem at large? And are we looking at the balance within this kind of the subsystems that exist. If we're not treating ethics as an embedded part of the process of development, then we failed as engineers, as innovation experts, as computational people. But I think now, you know, the, it's, it's, everyone knows um, values are very important in the design process. I think all I, would, I think these have all been great sentiments and there's not a whole lot I could, I could add uh, to these comments. I, I will say that um, along with keeping sort of the, the primacy of this sort of the, this, these ethical considerations is to also think about, um, I, I, I mean, I, I love the juxtaposition there of the staircase and the elevator. Um, and, and I think that, uh, you know, I've, I've recently met a lot of students who, um, who English has been their second language, for example, and, um, and they have, it's, you know, these large language models have totally changed the way in which they uh, communicate with, you know, the outside world, whether it be writing a cover letter, um, you know, I mean, they're, uh, or, or just simply trying to learn the syntax, you know, they, they can say, well, I, I, I need a, a paragraph that sort of says this, and then after they see it written, you know, and that's the beauty of these large language models, they, inc they include all the nuances, um, they end up learning a, a, in a different way. And so I think, you know, if we, if we target our innovation toward equity, toward diversity, towards inclusion, um, we have a greater chance of, of leaving more in than leaving more out. And, um, and I think that if um, slowing down completely would be a lot like noticing that there's a drug in our phase one trials that is having a, a positive impact on a group and then not changing um, how, you know, we're, we're allocating. I mean, eventually, once you notice that there is a positive effect, it becomes unethical not to maybe shrink your control group and grow your treatment group. And so, you know, we need to sort of be thinking about that also with these technologies that, you know, notice the good that they're doing along with the bad, and then try to move toward the good as opposed to just slowing things down just because of the bad. Right. So if I can add just one thing uh, yeah. to the points that have been made, you know, I've been thinking a lot lately about what people have been describing as the alignment problem, which is, you know, typically talked about in AI as, you know, that you set a certain goal for an AI system and that's not exactly what you had in mind and the AI could go up, you know, the paperclip issue or whatever, you know, the problem and so on. But I think one of the things that these AI systems have also done in my mind is reveal alignment problems in what we 
have been doing normally in the first place, right? So the example of plagiarism and writing college essays, for instance, is that we always took that, there was an alignment problem there in the first place, which is how do we get at what students know? And we said, oh, we're going to make them write a paper. Now, is that an accurate and a good representation of a student's knowledge? And it's, you know, represent, you know, and, and, and as a performance of their understanding, maybe not. And what AI has done is inserted itself into that alignment problem and said, hey, I can write that paper for you, which pushes us, I think, as educators to start thinking about how can we create better you know, performances of understanding than just writing a standard five paragraph essay. So I think that's been a very interesting sort of thing for me to think about that how this technology is actually making us question things we, that we sort of just took for granted. Um, so I think that's an interesting piece there as well. Punya, on those points, we've been talking with yourself and Ted and Sean about the front end of the applications of generative AI. But when you start to look at the back end in the production of these systems, Punya, you called it an open experiment. Of course, it's open AI. You know, do it and ask permission later, or let's see how far we can push regulation. And this actually has a lot to do with the underlying ethics of the sources of information that open AI has currently poured into, which we have limited knowledge about, to be, to be honest. Um, we don't know the authorship of the content. We have no uh, log or audit trail or blockchain of the actual quotations. Uh, we don't know if somebody asked the same questions, whether they will get the same responses back, you know, give or take that it seems to be the case that they will. But there's a lot that we don't know. And I know that uh, from reading information about the development of the future of these tools, that they will gain licenses with peer reviewed content providers, they will start to garner additional information, whether that's images uh, that are available, just like um, Clearview AI is scraping 10 billion images off the internet. We want to know more about the back end of this system. And that does have a lot to do with equity, accessibility. Uh, I know I took ChatGPT 3 for a run uh, in November uh, and December, and I was asking it a lot about digital mental health issues. I was uh, took on the persona of someone who was having a mental health crisis and started to drill in to see how far it would go, whether it would recommend for me people I should see in Arizona, whether uh, it would uh, do anything like take action if I said I was going to commit suicide. Uh, and I really pushed the boundaries of that discussion and it led to me not having access. Um, I still don't have access, by the way. Oh, so so the, the, the interesting question is, you know, and it, one of the excuses that came up was there were too many simultaneous users. And I thought to myself, well, is it the fact that I'm here in New South Wales, Australia, or is something else going on here? And uh, sharing this story with academics uh, in Europe, they've received the same kind of uh, denial of service, and that's what I'm going to call it, a denial of service attack. So um, in, in some ways, what I'm going to suggest here is that if we want um, everything to be open, then it's open access, and it's not actually going to be, uh, you know, yes, you can have the free access, you can have the platinum because you can afford it, and you can have no access because you're just a jerk. Um, so, so the question then becomes one of, if we start to build um, infrastructure uh, an ecosystem around its availability. Um, and Ted, I'm with you. You know, I've heard people in this library say, I feel better since ChatGPT has come on because I can, I can submit better assignments. And they're not saying, you know, it's a secret. They're even telling their lecturers that's what they're doing. And lecturers have no response. But th th at the same time, accessibility, you know, those, those people for whom uh, English is a second language um, may be relying on this in every facet of their life uh, to do basic things in a foreign country. But uh, what happens when you don't have access? And, and that's the ethics of the production side I want us to think about. So it's not just the applications, it's what's happening on the back end and that system of innovation that's forming around AI and beyond. Yeah, no, Katina, that's a really interesting point. And also one to remember that a lot of these platforms and services that are out there are not there for, for free. Uh, they might be a free option that you can do. I mean, even OpenAI, for example, right? I mean, they, when, you know, when the, um, organization was founded, it was intended to be, you know, AI built in the open so that we wouldn't have these sort of proprietary, you know, black boxes of technology. Um, but then that changed and it became a for-profit um, organization. And that, that's the issue you raise that I think a really interesting conversation point too around the, the ethics of access too, right? Like when 
especially as potentially as things kind of move on and continue and certain people are advantaged by the use of these technologies to do things to get, whether that be through employment or in, 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 um, you know, academic endeavors or whatever it might be, right? Like chat, even right now, the difference between chat GPT 3.5, which is sort of like the free version that you have access. But if you want the latest and greatest, you have to pay, I think, what is it? $20 a month. Um, I mean, that is something that a lot of households cannot afford. So then already, even with this rush, there's this sort of, there's the free version and then there's the paid version, um, which is already sort of setting sort of an inequity um, there as well. But I, so, I just want to, can, can I just combine the to you know, something that Punya and Katina just, you know, said that there, I don't think it's just about the price, because I, I think that, you know, we can't do a whole lot about the price of chat GPT, but combining something with what Punya just said about, you know, our expectation as faculty, for example, that the way in which we assess students is by having them write an essay, um, not only is that sort of, you know, maybe going to be, maybe that, that this really has exposed that that's always been sort of a silly way to assess students. And just like, you know, when, when mid journey and these other image, you know, generation tools came out, um, people said, oh no, now we can't trust a photo anymore. And so, you know, you never should have trusted a photo photos ever since photos were made, were not necessarily trustable things. But, and so I guess the, the question about access is not only, um, are these tools creating these, these barriers? Cause I think, they're, but they're also, are we, um, when we ask for certain things, are we are we disproportionately um, creating problems from one population to another? Because there always will be right. some populations of access tools and not. So maybe we can figure out as faculty at a university here better ways to assess students that don't disproportionately, you know, benefit one group over another. Thank you, Ted, for that. And I think, you know, we talk about the economics of access. I think there is another deeper economic fact that we need to be thinking about. And this, I heard this somewhere, and I thought this was really interesting, that apart from the book publishing business, almost every other media business is based on advertising. And now if you think about what these tools can do in terms of persuasion and so on, um, being these having character and personality as a chat bot, do build that through an advertising model, which is really about getting you to stick to, I mean, if you think about what happened with YouTube and a lot of these social media channels, which really became about making you stick on the website and hence taking you more and more down the rabbit hole of weirdness. Um, so, I mean, so those are the kinds of things I really worry about is the fundamental economic model going to be because these things cost money, how is it going to be sustainable? And if it's going to be an advertising based model, I really worry about that. Uh, because that to me uh, has it again, it is an alignment problem. You know, I used to tell my kids, like when they used to watch TV, I'm like, what is really, what are you really watching? I said, the real thing you're watching are the commercials. The stuff in between is just to make you watch the commercials. <laughs> you know exactly. what I mean? Like, that, yeah, that's the, you know, so I think we really, we need to be thinking about sort of the fundamental economic models that are going to underlie how these tools are going to be used. And I think there's a huge sort of an alignment problem there as well. I, I Punya, it's not going to take long to embed advertising into the free version of ChatGPT. I'll give you a basic example. You know, I thought asking for a list of psychologists in a particular area would be easy through ChatGPT. So I said, I'm looking for psychiatrists and psychologists in Tempe, Arizona. Can you give me a list? And ChatGPT responds, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't do directories. Pretty much you can see that uh, in the chat, in that conversation. So, okay, I thought, well, it's, is it going to take long? You know, do psychologists promote themselves uh, with good SEO on the internet? Well, of course they do. Even big platforms like Psychology Today, there are YouTube clips. You can see how you can put yourself higher as a psychologist or psychiatrist on the list uh, from a response, from a query, from an everyday user. So how long will it be before Katina Michael's name, you know, is up higher as a potential psychiatrist or Punya Mishra or Theodore Pavlich based on that advertising model. And the free version will be based on advertising. The, the, the paid version, as we see uh, uh, with other examples out there, won't be. But this then becomes a source of threat for this open tool, because how open is it? How predictable is it? How honest is it in giving me the information I require? So imagine Wikipedia was ruled by advertisements. You know, is this what ChatGPT might well do in the near future? Yeah, that's a really, I mean, it's a really interesting concept too, because I mean, that's a challenge we, that, that is persistent, right? Also 
right now, not knowing how those models are trained specifically, but also if we can learn those, how can those be gamed, right, to intentionally overweight something in terms of its of its of its you know importance and things like that. Um, so I am looking at the time. I can't. Thirty minutes has like come and gone so fast. It's been insane. Um, it's been an absolute, but I would just wonder if, if anyone of our panelists has any, any final thoughts you want to share quickly before we wrap up and sign off for today. I think, you know, I just, just want to riff off of what Katina said and, and, um, you know, is that I, it would be interesting to know how, what are other business models there? And, um, and if chat GPT is supposedly this disruptionary force, then you might imagine, well, maybe it's a public good. And so maybe there's a way to, you know, maybe like Wikipedia, it's a donation model. Maybe we need kind of a national public radio chat bot or something like that. Um, so I, I don't know. I just think that's a really interesting thought to maybe uh, end on is like to think about alternative models for public goods, public AI public goods in the future. I couldn't have said it better. I think that's a perfect way of thinking about these technologies because, you know, one thing that I sort of worry about, think about is, you know, we talk about these technologies through metaphors and so on, and then they come back and influence how we think about ourselves. And I think there is a, and unless and until we think of better models for the economics of it, because that's what's going to drive it down the road. Um, you know, and I, I love this idea of a sort of a, of a public uh, model for this. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great it, idea. I, I think that's what SFIS built in the master's program, a public interest technology good, right, or service. So I'm just going to give a plug there to our master's program. It is Theodore <laughs> and Punya, as you say, public interest tech through and through. There we go. Hey. Well, that's a perfect way to bring it all the way back um, for that. So thank you all so much. Katina, Ted, Punya, thank you so much. Um, for um, you know, for your time today, um, it looks like we do have a quick question in the chat. Um, if let's see, um, I'll go ahead and read this out. If anyone wants to take a read at that and see if you can, uh, uh, if you want to take a stab at answering that, that would be great. But um, again, just thank you so much for everybody uh, joining us today. Um, on behalf of myself and the entire expert panel, um, thank you for joining us. Um, on this generative AI teaching conversation. Um, special thank you to Sarah Elliott and uh, Allison Hall for helping administer and run all the things and run the Zoom uh, background here for us, making sure that all of these things run smoothly. Um, we really appreciate that. So we hope you've enjoyed your time with us today. I know 30 minutes went by really fast. If you're interested in learning more, please check the events calendar for future webinars and related sessions or cap if you, um, well, you wouldn't know it now, but there's also, you can catch the, you, if you've missed any, you can always catch them um, where we'll post the recordings. Um, so again, thank you all so much for joining us today. I hope you can come back. Hope we can continue these conversations at another time. Um, and so for me and from all everyone, thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your day and thank you very much. We'll hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, Katina. Bye. Thank yeah, you. Great to Punyang meet you. Always Thanks, fun. everybody. It's great. Yeah.